So we're, we're good on I'm that front. I'm used to Zencaster, so I do know that sometimes God, it's needed. God, Zencaster. Oh my God. <laughs> the, the pain caused by Zencaster is unreal. And mm -hmm. what's really good is Zencaster is particularly, it's like the likelihood of a failure increases as you reach the three hour mark, which when you're recording, when you, when you are now a, very excitingly, a co-host on a podcast that records them. Um, uh, hello, everyone. This is Rail Natter, by the way. Um, when you're on a co-host of a, a podcast that records regular three hour episodes, the likelihood of a Zencaster failure increases is somewhat exponentially which is um oh boy but um oh anyway and so yeah it, that was that was our cold open <laughs> we're doing it we're going <laughs> it is a pre hello everyone from the from the past it's a pre-record but um I, i'm very delighted that we have Cariad heather keir here um joining us um in the green room waiting for us to get started because we're talking about this is so we'll maybe talk about this a little bit in episode well this 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 came from a conversation in the basement of a, of a premier in slash travel lodge i can't exactly remember which it was um near the kill james bond live show when we were, we were which, which we went to and enjoyed and were both guests at um guests audience members well you are you're a guest if you go to a show something like that <laughs> yeah and it was we had a rip-roaring time but we before we even got you know i i was i was, I was you know three sips into my non-alcoholic beer and we were um talking about transit and uh, and i was just getting giddy and excited about transit so this is the episode result and i'm so excited about it because we are going to be talking about if i could put my mouse in the right place we're going to be talking about the um the the uh sorry the the vancouver regional rapid transit system which doesn't have a snappier name i i, I wait a minute no someone's shouting in my ear Sorry, no, that's SkyTrain. It's SkyTrain. We're talking about SkyTrain. <laughs> I'm very excited about this one. Yeah, and, and actually, as I've been as I've been kind of looking through the slides and 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 Carriad and I've been chatting, there is so much. In, there's just lots of interesting things for us to learn from this this tale, from the story, and and from what's hidden underneath these um, big thick chunks of um, of uh, of tarpaul well, of canvas. In fact, so without further ado, uh, Carriad is waiting for me to get on with the show. We're already late starting. Everyone, welcome to tonight's Rail Natter. And as the Intercity 225 fades away it's funny that i have a pacer uh in this um in, in the intro credits some um, spoiler alert pacers will they'll be back so oh carry it right carry it okay first of all we have it we have an intro landing slide so before uh, do the intro landing slide but before we do that i want people to actually be able to say hello to you so carry it hello Hello. Thank you so much for coming to Rail Natter. Um, uh, it's it's a delight to have you, and um, yeah, we, we we've, we're gonna have some fun today. I think uh, this evening, even though it's not evening, it's well, it is evening for you. It's no, it isn't. It's wait a minute, what time is it? It's, it's half past six. It's half past. Yes, it's the opposite of evening. It's morning. It's very morning. It's the time I was up this morning with a, a raising little one, and I forced you up at this time in the morning as well. Right, so. <laughs> Oh golly! Right. Anyway, Carriad, thanks so much for joining us on Rail I will return to the to the to our initial landing slide, but with but with introducing our two small faces in the top corner. Um, introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about what you do, and 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 um, uh, before we before we start talking about uh, Vancouver. Um, so uh, yeah, take it away. Yeah. So my name is Carriad Heather Keir. Um, I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada. Uh, my day job is actually cybersecurity, but um, I. Moonlight as a amateur historian doing a podcast about Canadian history. And uh, I also have a particular interest in transit. So I used to maintain a transit blog on co-host and rest in peace co-host. But uh, I've always loved writing about uh, transit history. Uh, one little cool fact is uh, my co-host, a good friend of mine, we both have speed run the entire SkyTrain system. And for a brief period of time, without our knowledge, we held the world record for riding oh. all the Vancouver SkyTrain network. Oh, that is cool. I, 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 arguably even cooler that you didn't know you didn't know <laughs> you didn't know that you'd done it. Yeah, um, that's very cool, actually. Ah. Um, so those, I, I, yeah. Pe firstly, cybersecurity in and of itself is a fun. I mean, we've already had some brief conversations, and you know, there's th there's an interesting subject, but um, but the history and then the fact that there's transit, you're transit adjacent. It's like, oh, this is perfect. There, there, there are stories to be told. Rail matter is 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 where we need to tell them. So, we having introduced yourself. Hello, Carrot. You now <laughs> need to. What is a, a Vancouver? What is one of yeah. those? 
So Vancouver itself is actually comprised of 21 municipalities. It's actually Metro Vancouver, I should be clear. Mm, yeah. uh, so 21 municipalities in an electoral area, which is kind of a scattering of areas without any municipal designations, which also includes the University of British Columbia. And one First Nations group, which is the Sawasan First Nations. Um, just so everybody knows, when I talk about this area, I do have to acknowledge the Squamish, Sawasan, Kwatlin, Stolo, Stoilatuf, Musqueam, Simiamu, and many other First Nations that pre-exist the settlement of Europeans. These are unceded lands, meaning they are stolen, but moving forward, I am going to use their colonial names. Yep. Um, the current population of city of Vancouver, which is where I live, is 750,000, but Metro Vancouver is just shy of 3 million. Now, Met sorry. No, no, no. I was just saying, I was saying like, it's size is really important. I just, just last night in, in our timeline, just recorded an episode uh, about Sheffield, about South Yorkshire, which is a, which has a metro population. So the wider metro population of one and a half million. So it kind of it, like, it's funny in, in two senses. Firstly, it shows Vancouver is an enormous city. And yeah, absolutely right. It's a city that us European folks came and just stole the land of a bunch of people who already live. It was there. They were living there. They were living there peaceably, relatively. Um, and we just stormed in, gave them diseases and shot lots of them. So uh, it's worth just yeah. like reminding everyone that that's, that's why these cities exist in North America now because we did that um but yeah vancouver like in north america Va vancouver massive city but also like on the list of all the cities it's not the biggest city and yet also no. sheffield not the very people don't think of sheffield much in the uk as being a big city but actually also like we're talking about millions of people anyway it's, uh, cities people people it's funny how cities are so vancouver here you said so there's so this wider metro population there was a three did you say three million just yeah. three million yeah and it's um, kind of interesting because it's hemmed in by the mountains to the north, uh, the Pacific, well, an arm of the Pacific Ocean to the west. And then there's an arbitrary line that goes out to the Fraser Valley to the east. And then the United States border is to our south. So we don't have a lot of space to move. And if you take a look at this map here, it shows the transit system um, in its current form, but also overlaid with a map of, uh, I believe it's all the boroughs of the Greater London. Oh, just nice. To kind of give oh, you that's what scale. that is. Oh, that's, oh, that's quite nice. Actually. Oh, yeah, so it's comparable. Right, so interesting point there. And this is why we're transit. It's funny, people talk about in North America say, oh, you know, our cities are big and sprawly and therefore it's difficult to get public transit to work. It's like, no, no, public transport, you, you need it even more because the the the, la the the reduced density, so the point I was going to make was going to be about density. It, within the space that you put here, about 10 million people in Greater London, right? So, so, yeah. so Vancouver will have some very dense areas for sure, but it will also have some other areas that are, are, are not hugely dense, right? As, as in the pattern of lots yeah. of North American so cities. In yeah. terms of density, um, you're looking at about 5,700 people uh, just in the city of Vancouver alone, but it, which actually puts it comparable to London. But once you leave the city of Vancouver, it starts to be about 900 persons for every square kilometer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a massive drop off. So a very dense core, actually, like really dense. Like that, yeah, that's like Manchester, Birmingham, Leith, uh, London densities. But yeah, then they're just, they're just a huge hinterland of, of kind of very low density, but yeah. all feeding that core, right? So it so this that's is where right. public transit becomes important because actually public transport gives you the speeds that make up for that sprawl, hence the hence the value in them. Um, in, in what we're discussing, uh, yes, I'm already sidelining. I said uh, yes. Also, everyone heard me <laughs> um, plugging in the Wacom so that I can John Madden my way in here. So here's a smiley face to prove that I know. Uh, I, I can now John Madden things on screen. Everyone will be happy to. Hear. So if you go, if you go to the next slide. Yes. Oh yeah. So today's system. Yeah. Okay. I did. I did put chapter splits in here. Today's system. So. Yes. Here's the map so, that we've just seen. Yes. So same idea to give you some scale, but then yeah. on the left here we see the uh, transit system itself. So <clears throat> SkyTrain itself is run by two operating companies under the provincially run statutory authority called TransLink. It first opened on December 11th, 1985, and today has just shy of 80 kilometers of trackage, uh, with uh, five and a half, five, six kilometers approaching end of construction, 16 to commence sometime in the next few months, and there's like 20 kilometers more if the slated expansions promised in the latest provincial election actually go ahead. Yeah. The system is entirely grade separated and is also automated. And there are three lines. There is the Millennium Line, the Expo Line, and the Canada Line. And I set them out of order, I just realized now, but the Expo Line was the first line built. What makes the system rather special is that it's capable of 70-second headways. Oof. But, okay, yeah, that's it's nice. capable. It's been done yeah, okay. uh, during the Olympics. 
but often trains are about one to two minutes apart during peak time. And usually you don't wait more than eight to 10 minutes at most for an, another train. So like I've had friends visit and be like, why are you not running for the trains? Like, well, it's going to come in a couple of minutes anyway. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So, and, and I suppose we're, we're going to talk about rolling stock in a minute because what I've just realized I haven't done, and I, I may add in post as a humorous little interjection is where this sits on the not a Metro sorter. But so far, with 70-second headway potential, and I do like to use potential of the system, this is fully grade-separated, 70-second potential. It's now riding on the passenger capacity of the vehicles, but it's hot on for being a very good metro system, like really decent. So we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll cut that in, in in post, but that's uh, 70 seconds is really quite good. So trains. We've got to talk about the trains, right? Um, yeah, we do. So this is this is going to be a mouthful, but this is the Urban Transportation Development Corporation Intermediate Capacity Transit System, or just call it a Mark One. <laughs> um, these trains were introduced in 1985. Nearly all of them are in operation today, but are bound to be scrapped in the next three years. They come in two car Mary sets, I guess you call them, with no public gangway between them and have four doors each. Um, they can hold about 80 persons per car. Uh, they have a revenue speed of 80 kilometers per hour um, and you typically today see them in six car arrangements, so you get about five hundred people at any given time. Nice. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, six car, eighty about by five hundred. Nice. Yeah. These are a little bit like smart. I mean, they're eighty five, so it's one of those situations where actually the trouble with something that's built in nineteen eighty five is that it's actually potentially harder to keep something from eighty five running than it is from something from seventy five because it's got a load of very obsolete electronics in the way that like some of the under underground. Um, like, for example, on the Piccadilly and the Bakerloo, they're still running stuff from the 70s, and mm -hmm. it's fine. Whereas some of the, some of the like early or late 80s, early 90s stuff is actually you know, more difficult to maintain because it has electronics that look like they've just got the scale wrong. Um, yeah, anyway, exactly. sorry, I'm not going to keep derailing you. Um, but that's yeah, fine. okay, so here they are. Um, that's nice. Okay, good. The Mark 1s. We, so, we can go to the next one, yeah. The Mark 2s. This is the Bombardier ART Mark II. ART stands for Advanced Rapid Transit. Um, these were introduced in 2001. The one on the right is um, that model. And they were to supply a new rolling stock for a new line. Uh, these trains are significantly different than their older siblings. Um, they're married like before, but there's a public or rather a walkable gangway between each car. And they're also longer. They have two extra doors. Mm, there are okay. two generations. The first was built in Burnaby, British Columbia. Um, the provincial government didn't like the incoming provincial government didn't like this idea so they just scrapped all like like i guess we can say uh funding to it or whatever mm. uh and then the second generation which you see on the left were purchased for the 2010 winter olympics um and they are upgraded in the sense that they have slightly different seating and they have destination markers and maps that update in internally um unlike the mark ones and a big big reason why i prefer riding these any day of the week is that they're air conditioned oh <laughs> yeah it's so important people really take for granted how important that is but if as soon as you spend any time on the central line it, 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 to be honest any time of year suddenly you realize how much uh, heat is a problem the central line in summer is brutal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. these trains can also hold 130 persons per car um, but i swear you can get more in there and they when you're operated in um they operate as two car sets, as I mentioned, but they're usually joined together to make a four car set, and um, that makes their operating capacity around 530. So 530, nice. Okay, yeah, good stuff. Um, <clears throat> so then the next vehicle on the list. So this is the Rotom EMU, right? This they is... are, and admittedly, they're not my favorite. They are air conditioned, at least. <clears throat> Positive. Yeah, so these were brought in for in 2009 for the 2010 Winter Olympics because a brand new line was built for it. Mm. But unlike the previous cars mentioned, um, there's nothing special for, about them. In fact, they're the least special of the three Lion cars. Um, they only operate on one line, as I said, and they'll only operate on one line. And they're just completely incompatible with the rest of the system. The only difference or similarity between them is the rail gauge and the automation software. That's it. The signaling is the same as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the next on the list. Ah, okay. Bombardier. I mean, it's, it is a veritable menagerie, isn't it? Um, it is. But this is, in a way, this is a good thing. This is what, this is why, and I, yeah, I'm not going to mention the book again but i'm going to mention the book i talk about this in the book but like railways are open source tech and it's fine that you can like don't get me wrong it's perhaps not great for like operating efficiency to have 20 different vehicle types but you can have that and it's and they all work like if they're built fine they'll work with each other you it, it's okay it's fine uh so here's the um yeah was it the bombardier novia metro 300 or yeah the art mark 3 
That's right. So these are my favorite to ride. Mm. Um, they've been in revenue service since mid-2016. Um, as part of extension, they bought a whole bunch of new trains, and then they bought more of them. Um, they have all the good features of the Mark IIs, but they are now in four car sets, meaning you can walk from end to end, um, and that's really nice. Yeah. My biggest beef with this is more of a childish one. They do not have a driver's seat, so the other trains, um, actually, the Rotom has the same problem. You can't sit in the front of the train and pretend you're driving the train. Yeah, that that's that's changing on... There are two systems in the UK. In fact, you, you'll know this. Glasgow Subway, the, the new Stadlers, don't have the sit at the front thing. And the the tiny room metro, the tiny room metro don't have you don't the new again Stadlers. I'm a big fan of the Stadler kit, but the lack of sit at the front pretend you're the driver is is really upsetting. Um, so yeah yeah yeah. Um, so these are four car fixed sets. Uh, what's the capacity? What's the rated capacity per car? If I don't. Not, I forgot to make rank a note of that, but I don't oh, think okay. it's. I think it's slightly higher than the 530 on the previous set. I imagine it's maybe 550. That that sort of there. yeah, that sort of region. We can we can Google that. So so essentially, we'll we'll find out which of all of these is the highest capacity fixed formation, you know, long formation. And then the I will now cut in, or at some point in the next minute or two, I will cut in the uh, the the not a metro sort. But I have a feeling these will be with with vehicles that size. It's a good chance it, it might be light metro, but it, no, it's probably full metro. I'd imagine given those potential headways. So. Now, wait a minute. Is that all of them, or is there another? There's another. Oh, my goodness. The this Mark is a brand five. new vehicle from Alstom. Mm. So these are the Mark Fives, and you may have noticed I skipped four, but I'll explain what that is in uh, a okay. moment. Um, yep. These started being delivered in December of last year. Um, I've heard all sorts of um, people saying um, various things, but supposedly they might be in revenue service by January of next year. Um, they are different from the last two series of trains, and... Uh, but they're made by Alstom as opposed to Bombardier. Yep. Now, what's big about these is that these are five car Mary sets. And these will max out the entire length of the 80 meter platforms at each station. Yep. And they, what's really, really cool about this is when these trains come into revenue service, you will be able to see all generations of SkyTrain vehicles operating on the Expo Millennium lines <laughs> for three years. Oh, amazing! That is cool. It really will be a, a little, a little, a little menagerie of every single. Like, it's going to be quite cool to see those, that that um, the comparison from from eighty five to to twenty sixteen. No, not twenty sixteen. That was the last one. To to now to the like the state of the art. These 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 are the state of the art. Um, they do look yeah. quite smart. Fair play. They also look roomier. Actually, I don't know why they. they I think it's possibly because they've got a very large front window. They they do look a bit roomier, although inside they'll be exactly the same. Um, they have changed the seating arrangements oh, yeah. so that there's more standing room, from what I understand. Yeah, which might sound annoying, but actually, if if, if these things are getting crush loaded regularly, then actually it's more safe and more comfortable to have more standing room. Uh, a, a bit like the London Overground stock. That, that uh, in fact, a bit like Crossrail, where the majority of Crossrail is is is, is kind of bench seating. Down, down the side of the vehicle and most of it's for standing because a lot of the time it's like an extreme between sometimes it's super quiet and so the, the, the seats are fine and the alternative is it's absolutely rammed and standing and people aren't spending more than a few minutes on the train anyway right or, or you know more exactly. than 10 minutes so um so very nice so so five car train um do you have a rated number for the total passengers on the, on these ones uh, they have not announced that <laughs> ah, interesting yeah they often, to be honest they get the, the, the manufacturers are really cagey about these numbers now for some reason like it's 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 like it can, it can take a bit of time to dig this stuff out particularly for metros for like regional trains it's not such a big deal not least because you can just walk through the train and count them but in terms of the rated numbers for trains that have standing they're often quite cagey about it possibly because if people start doing the numbers they feel like a sardine <laughs> So yeah, where's the Mark Four? <laughs> yes, why? Okay, right. I have a question, which I should have been. Where's the Mark Four, Carrie? Where, where's it gone? <laughs> so that's actually technically the Mark Three. What TransLink decided was that they would upgrade the Mark Fours at some point down the road. They preserved the option to do that, and if they do so, those vehicles would become the Mark Four. I see. Okay. Okay. That's so it. that's it, the only reason why. <laughs> so they've left a gap in case they do some very heavy 
refurbishment on a on one of the earlier stocks and, and bring it up to kind of modern standards, but it, it won't quite be as good as the modern trade. Do you know what? That almost makes some sense. I, I quite like that, actually. Fair play. Um, yeah. Translink, that makes some sense. I, I've got font questions, actually, that I might need to ask when we see another picture from the station, because... Um, I've seen some fonts that look just vaguely familiar, like Officina is being used <laughs> here. And I can. Do you want me to tell you about this now, or do you want to wait? So I'm going to flip back a slide or two. Wait a minute. Uh, to uh, yeah, here, this, this here, this font here on the platform title looks like Officina. Is it? I wrote about this. Is it Officina? I wrote about it in a blog entry. But what I will tell you is um, there was a fact-finding expedition done by TransLink uh, to the London Underground. And a okay. lot of the the wayfinding and some of the design choices were inspired by, um, I guess, Harry Beck's um some of the original initial and, stuff. And particularly, <laughs> some of, particularly some of the um, platform vertical mapping showing the route that i spotted in pictures later that looks quite familiar to the london underground system no the officina here is that's the um the modern scott rail scotland's railway font and okay. it, that, I'm, I'm sure that that's what that is it's very nice actually anyway right i digress so this doesn't look like modern stock carry what's going on well, I'm sure you're familiar with Interurbans after a WTYP episode <laughs> from a couple of uh, weeks ago. Yes. Uh, but like many North American cities, Vancouver and the Fraser Valley had dismantled its functioning interurban system in favor of buses. Oh. So, yeah. So the BC Electric Railway operated 11 lines across the region and beyond, plus numerous tram or streetcar uh, routes, totaling around 380 kilometers. They also operated on Vancouver Island, but that's another topic. Around 1947, so just after the Second World War, the BC Electric Company, its parent, noted that rail subsidies for um, uh, for their operations were just non-existent. So they opted to move to passenger service. Uh, sorry, opted to move their passenger service to the roads because hey, we don't have to pay for the roads. Yep. So by 1958, all interurban services were just non-existent they ceased oh, operations oh. so, so if you skip to the next slide yeah so uh, so so that that's a little tease for god how did we get so so if so we've got the situation there as kind just lined uh kind of laid out for us rail is gone so how do we get to the point where we have skytrain well yeah uh, oh god so oh, yeah oh, 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 <laughs> there's there's gore okay i should have done a content warning there is gore in this picture in this in, the, in this slide oh my goodness so this, the vehicle in the bottom right did survive. I have been inside of it. It's really pretty. Uh, it unfortunately only has like 20 meters of track that it can operate on. There are other operating vehicles on Heritage Lines, I should admit. One of them uh -huh. is actually in a hybrid fit configuration where they just uh, like have a trailer with a diesel uh, oh, generator yeah. on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, nice. yeah, yeah. Um, but all the lines are all sold off to like Canadian Pacific or Canadian National or just left to go to rot. Um, but a few did survive and were not sold in time by the time the provincial government expropriated the BC Electric Company in 1961, which ended up forming our um, our power company, BC Hydro, which is actually a crown corporation or, as you would call in the UK, a statutory corporation. Uh, OK, yeah. So there's a couple of reasons for why the government did it. But in particular for this um, show, um, the government was rather unhappy about this private company killing off its rail services. They'll do that. They'll do that, folks. Private companies will kill off your rail service, just as a just just as a heads up. So at the time, the provincial government ended up with two rail companies, um, both operating around the uh, the Vancouver area. Um, the other one being BC Rail, which is its own mess to talk about. But if you take a look at the bottom here, there's a map that shows a red line. Um, that line may look familiar if you looked at the previous uh, maps. Mm, so yeah, so you've got. So we've got here this, there's this, yeah, I was going to say, in trace through to the previous maps, right? Um, yeah. So on screen, we, I, I should do my best to audio describe. So we have, so we've got the image of the last trip on the on the top left here um, in nice grayscale, which is very nice. Um, also weird to see the, the, the Union flags on the, I always find it oh, weird. Oh, Canada didn't have its own flag uh, technically until um, the um, late 1960s, like, um, we did an episode about this uh, some time ago, but Canada's flag, technically speaking, is still the Union flag. Um, but we actually, the flag that everybody is familiar with has only been around for the past uh, 60 years. Oof, crikey. Second image, fire. <laughs> They've pushed over one of these beautiful cars and have just set fire to it. They're just burning it. They're just destroying it. It's like Most uh, of them were destroyed, yeah, like just like this. 
what <laughs> yeah uh, and then you've got uh, you've got the picture the heritage one that's still that thankfully saved so people can kind of just experience what that looked like it does look a little bit i have to say the design looks a little bit like it's been made from um bits of house lego so like the the door is like the door the like the lego house door the windows are like the the, the wind. it looks like it's kind of been put together from panels of a house but it's got a very fetch it, i mean it doesn't mean it doesn't I, I, it doesn't mean it looks bad it looks great it's just of that it's just of a particular vintage that it has that vibe also the the like the racking and the top is also fascinating like the sort of the wooden grill pattern they've gone for it's it's, it's they're very interesting um interurban cars and then you've got the map and from the from the from the city of vancouver archives which kind of annotates some of what um what we're talking about so mm-hmm. uh yeah sorry anyway i interrupted carry on go on oh no you're fine we can uh, move on actually so well this is nice because there's lots of p-way in this image um it's very yeah. straightforward p-way but it's p-way not this track nonetheless uh a, a lot for our emp chums as well because there's telegraph poles galore in this shot um and some interesting little architecture as well this little halt it's very nice yeah i'm having a hard time remembering if this is um the line that's actually uh important to um this uh, presentation but um yeah this is what what the lines looked like back in the uh 1940s 1950s so yeah yeah we can just kind of gives you an idea of things and i think we move to the next slide yeah, we'll so, see something interesting so these are some objects and these objects yes. are train objects on the left is a well it's a it's a tram it's, it's yes. correct me if i'm wrong it's a tram it's a tram it's got the word vancouver in the um in the top so someone's someone's uh uh being a bit optimistic that's on the left hand side it's uh is, is this red and white actually what is it trying to see the logo is it Siemens? is it a Siemens tram it's a Siemens LRV. Yeah, LRV nice so these are the things so this is i'm judging by the photographs here that we're talking about maybe early 70s is this is this 70s these images from so one is from the 70s well okay so let me explain this because okay, this yeah, actually yeah, requires a little context hmm. um so the history like rather the importance of rail transport wasn't lost on many locals hmm. so in the 1960s, there was a proposal to build a monorail from downtown Vancouver to the airport, which would have followed a previous right of way that the BCER had used. Yep. Now, that went nowhere. But the reason why I chose this photo is, um, or on the right, is that this monorail did get built for the World's Fair Expo 86. But what's really fascinating about this particular monorail is that it got taken apart after the World's Fair because it only served a small area. Yeah, and was shipped to Britain and is now in use at Alton Towers. <laughs> uh, that is where monorail should be, is theme parks. Uh, <laughs> if you're building any kind of scale transit system, monorails offer you no benefits over just going for a. You can literally just have an elevated tramway. That's fine. Um, but that's interesting. So it's interesting. So so that okay. So that image is from the. This is this is eighty six. You said that this that's this correct, image. From, yeah. The image on the left here. So the image on the right is. I'll, I'll just already describe. Firstly, there is an enormous watch. That's the very important thing to say. There's a giant watch the size of a six-story building or whatever. Uh, it's very strange. Uh, there's a lot of other just general expo vibes stuff. Some some like propellers and some, some lots of fair type. Fa- Ex- it's an expo. They look nuts. You know, it's lots of technical wizards uh, with a monorail going through. This now Mil- that's now. I was about to say Milton Keynes. No, that'd be funny as well. But no, not in Milton Keynes. It's in Alton Towers. So um, uh, which is nowhere near Milton Keynes. On the left, though, we have um a type of tram that was part of the of the tram renaissance i would say is one of the one of these vehicles were part of the renaissance were kind of vehicles that you were seeing in the renaissance in the in the kind of the the transition from the third to the fourth quarter of the previous century let's call it where we went from old trams to new trams people started using like light rapid transit and 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 sort of these sort of technical terms but really we're just talking about trams squared that's just trams but they're the trams but we've learned things to make them better like more segregation entirely off street running sections tunneling bits of it and we see this renaissance on trams but these vehicles these kind of transition tram vehicles are part of that story and certainly the siemens one here was part of that happening a lot and, and certainly in 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 germany we were seeing a lot of that kind of pioneering work in places like um in places like Köln um, and others where you you had sort of had strassenbahns being turned into into sort of uh, stadtbahns and and all these sort of 
hybrid type systems using real tech. Anyway, sorry, I digress. So, the, but the, but but Siemens at the time were were absolutely going. Well, this has worked here. We can make this work elsewhere. Let's go to let's go to other places and sell this to the, the Americans, also the Canadians. Um, and then so they clearly they've they've decided to stick Vancouver on the top and not with the optimism of first it being bought. But anyway, that's my made up story about this tram. What's the actual story of this vehicle? What, why is it here? And where so is in here? the nineteen seventies? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was recognized that car traffic was getting worse in Vancouver. Um, efforts to build a freeway system or motorway um, right through the city of center were thwarted. Um, community yes. activism just completely killed the idea of having a freeway go through the middle of the city. There are no freeways in the city limits other than a four kilometer stretch that just straddles the border of the, of the city of Vancouver and it just goes off to the North Shore. Toronto, but this is, you can learn from this, you maniacs. You can learn <laughs> from this. What the hell are you doing? Look to look to Vancouver to see the future. Uh, I just I cheered because I was so depressed from the Cincinnati episode of uh, WTYP and just how much horrible highways gore there is through what would have been a beautiful city center. Ugh. So it's not entirely a happy story <laughs> because oh. um, they did build one kilometer of expressway through entering into downtown Vancouver, and in the process they took out a neighborhood called Hogan's Alley, which was predominantly black, and it included the home of one. Jimi Hendrix's grandmother. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, it's painful how often it's like, oh, the highway goes tr through the through the, the, the high population black part of the city. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, which city yeah. is that? Oh, just to insert any city name. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So, the sitting provincial government in 1976 um, imported the Siemens LRV from West Germany to yep. operate on one of the lines used by the BCER, which is now owned by BC Hydro. And BC Hydro will become important for what happens in the future. They ended up mothballing this not long after because um, the government at the time, the NDP, were defeated in a provincial election to the Social Credit Party or SoCreds. So it just sat in a shed for like 20 years until it was uh, sent back to Germany. Now it's in a museum somewhere in like Stuttgart <laughs> or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the reason why we had it. And they did test it on the lines and they found that the something to do with the wheels did not mesh well with the existing rails uh, that were in place. And of course... This is a, a rail line that ended up being primarily industrial after it was no longer doing interurban service. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, another lesson that um, that Canada has not learned, which is um, when you're putting the vehicle on the rails, it doesn't just magically work. You need to have the right wheel profile and the right rail profile. Yes, I'm looking at you again, Toronto. Yes, I'm looking at you again, Mrs. Swagger. Uh, yes, I'm looking <laughs> at you again, Hur Ontario. Oh my goodness. Uh, yes, I have worked on these schemes, and yes, they did only retrospectively realize that they've got the wrong wheel, wheel rail interface, and also the wrong type of wheel damping on the vehicles as well, so these things are not designed to go at the speeds they're designed to go at, which means increases the likelihood of derailment. You heard it here first, folks. In fact, I'm pretty sure they've had several derailments on the other on the preceding scheme, so I'm talking about who, who LRT, but on another scheme that's part of the wider sort of um, uh, Toronto transit uh, sort of push they've had derailments as a result of this being got wrong and lots of massive claims so uh, great work all around so we, mm -hmm. sorry the point of that being we've still not learned this lesson uh so good stuff um so next slide i'm gonna put the next slide oh yes oh i love a mo <laughs> i love a monocolor like like a single color other than black uh bit of publicity that's so nice mm -hmm. on screen we have two maps and sorry well, yeah, we do have two maps actually. But we have we have a map in high res, and then we have a a sort of color scanned um, sort of uh, consultation document, I guess. Um, I think that's from a newspaper clipping. Ah, okay, um, yeah. This one's been sitting in my collection forever. Um, so there's some. I'm going to say some nice things here. So this new government, despite being um, conservative leaning. Uh, were serious about implementing a system and started to do consultations and develop plans for a long-term future for Metro Vancouver. Actually, at the time they called it Greater Vancouver, but whatever. Yeah. The government correctly identified that in order to fix the region's roads, they could not just alone adopt new lanes and highways everywhere. They had to fix everything. Oh, that is music. If I'd been clever, I'd have got my sound deck up and I'd have been doing like applause and cheering and stuff. That's That's beautiful. Um, it's nice to, I, I like this map because they're also showing how the transit acts as a feeder, acts as a core, you know, having the high capacity core, you can then have feeder, uh, you know, the, your, your local bus is feeding into it. It's, it's nice. That's actually what's really good about this. So this map on the top left, yeah. um, is largely built as of today. Um, nice, at least yeah. in spirit, there's some kind of exceptions, but whatever, these are plans after all. And 
I didn't mention this in my notes later, but you are correct. What they did is when they introduced SkyTrain service into Metro Vancouver, they just uh, rearranged the buses so it started feeding the uh, the oh, train service. Music to my ears. Integrated system. Uh, Tony Way Metro did this. We did this with Martha Lauren. Like, they, like it was actually uh, you know they thought about the whole system that they integrated the buses and the transit. So that you end up, firstly, so you don't end up with compete, you don't end up with buses trying to compete with the with the, the the mass transit, but also because the system works far better when it's all tied together. When you're getting the buses feeding passengers into the into the high core, it 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 works. It's good. Oh, I I I'm getting very excited, but no, that I'm I'm very happy to hear that, Carrie. That's good stuff. Did it stick? So I think well, we can we'll find out jump ahead, though. By yeah. the way, because yeah, yeah, yeah. this is really really like we picked Ooh. our we picked our future. Yeah, I mean, yeah, here is, so, right, two pictures. On the left-hand side, we have a a concrete uh, sort of uh, viaduct structure climbing up um, above a highway. Uh, it's, it, it's it's rails on slab track with a with a, a center, a set of padway for walking. It's got what appears to, well, we'll talk more about the actual system itself momentarily, but there is, it's, it's a modern-looking system with a funny little bug-eyed sort of test-looking vehicle whizzing along, just like a one-car thing or, or like a little, little sort of thing. And on the left, right, nope, the other one, right-hand side, we have some blue steps. This is the the, the pic before the photo op. They've got the, the car with the canvas mm -hmm. over it. It's the photo we did at the start um, uh, with the, the blue and red stripe and they're about to, someone's going to pull that down and reveal the vehicle that's on a low loader before they put it on the track, I guess. But um, there's the photo op moment. So, so, so tell, tell us everything about what's going on here. Yeah. So you correctly identified this is actually a test system. So what they did on March 1st, 1982, is the ground was broken to build a one kilometer demonstration line from what is now Main Street Science World Station towards the east of the city. Um, this opened in the spring of 1983. 1983 and uh, free rides were offered to the media and the public to showcase the technology that would power what was then known as the Advanced Light Rapid Transit System, or ALRT. And ALRT, after a yeah. few months of demonstration, it concluded, and the rest of the 21.5-kilometer track was built alongside what was the old BCER Central Park Line. Nice. So, okay, a few things to play. Firstly, that's a very good. It's a very good idea to build a little trial system for this thing, particularly particularly when you have like a potentially public transit averse population. You build a little trial. You build it out in this sort of outskirts a bit because then the you know you can you can put the thing up quite cheaply and without much disruption. But it allows you to also. It's not just for getting the public on board, but it allows you to also make sure that you're kind of getting your systems integration right. So you can do the things like trialing. Well, we do. So, for example, you can you can buy someone else's vehicle and get all the systems integration stuff right, and use that to then build the specification for the the, the kind of the squadron fleet of vehicles. So, number one, very useful for that. Uh, number two, you can kind of get people used to what the construction looks like. You can get passengers excited about what the potential they might have. Um, but uh, but also, you're building the start of the infrastructure. So, if you've got a little bit of money and you build the thing, people see it and go, "That's cool. We want more of that." It means that it makes it much more difficult to scrap the thing in the future. Whereas if you if you just have, if you just say we're going to just do the whole thing and but but we're not going to start until we do the whole thing, it's very easy to cancel it when it, nothing exists. Whereas it becomes very difficult to cancel this when you have built not impossible. See see also lots of other North American cities, but it becomes quite difficult to to make this go away if a stretch has been built and people locally like it. Um, so yeah, sorry, a, a soapbox again. But um, the, well, this, <laughs> okay. hey, I tell you what, we did say what we can learn from SkyTrain, and we've already learned quite a lot. So um, cool. No, uh, yeah. good stuff. So the reason why they chose this system is, and this is the provincial government that picked it. Um, they there was two reasons. So BC Hydro, again, the power company, was still a railway operator at the time, and they did not want to have passenger run, uh, passenger trains operating on its tracks. So it made it clear that industrial customers had to be serviced first. Two huh. things about this. <laughs> the first being that it should be noted that BC Hydro exited the railway business sometime in the 90s. And then the other thing is, is that passenger rail service, while it has no federal protection in Canada, which is I, I can get on my soapbox about this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, because of the BCER's special status within the province, um, there are riders in place in provincial legislation that stipulate that passenger services do have access. So it's a little bit different from the rest of like the federally mandated lines. Yeah. And the other reason is, and this is a conservative leaving government, so 
labor costs could be kept lower because it's a computer doing the job of a person. Yes, of course. Yeah. This is the thing that makes the conserv- the lowercase and the uppercase conservatives happy is that they've installed the system driverless. It's the same with Docklands Light Rail in London. I'm sure we'll talk about that momentarily as well. Like the, 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 these things were popular in the 80s because, because union. Union bad. Yeah. Union bad. Uh, you know, obviously not. But like the, this is this is the logic of the time. The thing, the irony is, of course, uh, we may talk about this. Uh, sorry, guys, still need staff running the thing, and those guys can go on strike. Uh, so you've not really solved the problem, but we do have some good public transport, so that's fine. So, you know, okay, we'll, and we'll talk about the tech in a minute, so I'm not going to sink us. So the, the other picture then, so so we've got the, 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 the big tarps, tell us. Yeah, so that's actually the test vehicle in this case. Um, oh, interesting, this is- okay. These vehicles were sent from Kingston, Ontario, from a company that I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, these are um, pretty similar to the Mark Ones, hmm. but there's a couple little tiny differences. They run as individual sets, so they do not need to be married in order to operate. Yep. They actually, I think, they share the same guts between them. So, and technically speaking, they could operate uh, by them like individually, but they, they're married. They're not going to be decoupled. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They're married over like a fixed bar rather than a, rather than an autocoupler type situation or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So these were sent back, and one of them was modified and came back. But I will talk about that um, in a future slide. Okay, so uh, we must press ahead, which is. Well, that's here, just another shot of this oh yeah, here, there, just to kind of give you an idea of what oh we're yeah, running. Free rapid transit little, rides and also some very vigorously uh, vigorously early 80s North American vehicles here. It's very nice, mm-hmm. actually. Dodge and a real and... trolley bus, which is actually um, oh, kind yeah. of a survivor of the uh, tram or streetcar system. They just replaced them with trolley buses. Oh, that is nice. Uh, tomorrow's transit today. It's all quite nice. It's quite nice. It's a nice, simple livery. I quite like the little the little stripe situation. It's mm-hmm. it's um it's nice. I mean, it, it's very it's very Amtracky actually. It's it's got like it, it, the blue and white and red stripe is such a common feature of like transit systems everywhere because it's also like you know uh, network southeast also also have the like stripe. It's like a very common common uh, glyph, but it looks nice. It's it's so, really neat and smart. <laughs> the sad thing about it is that I'm ninety percent convinced that these colors were chosen because they matched the colors of the sitting provincial government. Oh really? <laughs> So, uh, because you can kind of see this in later um, later liveries, although as time goes on, it seems to be less of a thing. But yeah, we could, I just wanted to show this photo because I thought it was actually quite neat to, to show what it looked like back in the early 1980s. It is nice. So, we have to talk about ICTS. So, what mm. is that? <laughs> Tell us about ICTS. <laughs> so, ICTS, or Intermediate Capacity Transit System, was developed in Ontario by then Provincial Crown Corporation, Urban Transportation Development Corporation, or UTDC. So, in the 1970s, much like Vancouver, Toronto identified that its transport network was sorely lacking and needed a solution. So, the government of Ontario, through Go Transit, um, that's yeah. what the Go stands for. Uh, came up with the concept of Go Urban, which was to service the Hamilton, Toronto, Scarborough area. And it would have had hundreds of kilometers of maglev track. We're using a system from Germany from a company called Kraus Maffei. Oh, yes. We cover that in our maglev episode. Well, it's not a rail natter, actually. It was one of my pre-rail natter uh, videos. But yes, the Kraus Maffei system, uh, the M-Bahn is what, they, yes. is what they called it. Yes, the M-Bahn. So, so what happened is like with the West German government, like pulled funding from it and thus uh, Ontario was kind of um, left in the dark, but it didn't stop the UTDC from looking at a system for alternatives, but it didn't immediately go to heavy rail. So what it did is it implemented a rubber tire system yeah. and found that the traction system uh, or the traction, I guess traction system is the way to say it, was not very effective with rubber tire because it couldn't meet the 15 millimeter uh, tolerances required for this thing to actually operate. Yeah, and so they ended up going to tried and true rail um, systems. They and made the right call. They got to the right decision. They did it from first principles and wasted some time in the process, but they did get back to the right call, which is, which is a delight. I'm very pleased that they did that. So yeah, it's it's on it's on tracks. And yeah, there's yeah. a load of other kind of mildly proprietary stuff on there, but actually fundamentally, you're, for your contractors, you are just building a a railway, and 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 yeah, the fact that it then has a mildly proprietary powering system. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Um, so yes, it's Scarborough has apparently got the system first, but um, I am going to nitpick on in a couple slides for now, but we can show everybody how it works because I've kind of yes. given a little bit away. So it's 
that's it's linear induction. All it does is it just propels the vehicles along the rail by having free moving wheels and just something to pull it along. It's a very simple system. It kind of kept some of its maglev heritage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know, not a bad use. Well, we can we might get more into the into fiddly details of it, but um, like. It's fine. It's neat. It's a it's it's a nice use of Lathwaite's you know magnetic river. It's a it's a it's a nice neat use of that um, of that technology as a as a traction system. And um, also, it takes a lot of kit out of the train, right? Mm-hmm. Because you don't have to have you don't even need traction motors. You just you just have basically a you basically have a tea tray on wheels that just needs to have a magnet in it, right? That that to all intents and purposes is what we're talking about in the so so it, it's even lighter than a conventionally electrified um, train because you don't need traction motors. You don't need all that kit. I I presume this it, it will have its own braking system. Oh um, yeah. It, oh, I I can certainly tell you this ooh, thing yeah, can yeah. stop. Yeah 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, it also has like articulated bogies, uh, which is yeah, really okay. nice for some of the tight turns it does take. Ah, yeah. um, it does work well in the snow. I purposely use some snow photos just oh, yes, uh, nice. to also make it clear what it is. Yep. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. The only thing that it doesn't do well in the snow is we don't heat our switches. So when we get snowstorms, um, which ha- don't happen that often, like we're not like the rest of Canada, like the the average uh, low during um, the winter is like two degrees and then eight degrees is a normal high. Like it's not like Toronto where you can be like below freezing for a whole month. Yeah. Oh, that sounds more British in, in your weather then. You probably still get oh, more that, snow. There, there's a reason but... why London and I get along. Uh, yeah, 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 that's it. But it's a, okay. So first, also, uh, everyone listen to this from Vancouver who runs SkyTrain. Uh, yeah, folks, you can just fit switch heating strips really easily. Like we can, you can, we can, you can buy those off the shelf. They're super easy. That's cheap. You can get those fitted. F- switch heat your switches. Uh, that's fine. It's cheap. It's easy. Do it. Um, but also, no, that's it's quite nice. It's quite nice seeing the thing. There's this this sort of slid pad where you've got the, the induction. Uh, it, it's it's neat. I'm I'm quite I'm quite pleased about this. I'm not saying that we should rip down all of our OLE and put this up. No, but it's it's it, it is a really neat little solution. I, I do quite like it. Yeah, one of the things you may, uh, you may have noticed is that uh, Vancouver is a very hilly place because we are buckled up against uh, mountains. Yeah. And so these trains do have the ability to achieve uh, 6% or 1 over 17 um, slopes. Wow, so yeah, nice. And in theory, it can actually do 8% or 1 in 13. Oof. Yeah, that's in the theory. thing where you're putting traction power onto a rail. You, Yeah, that is that is more than... You could achieve this. This is the advantage of essentially having a piece of cardboard, um, and p- having a magnet on one side and then a magnet on the other, and dragging the magnet up the thing. Is that you can do that up quite a steep slope? <laughs> that is essentially what's happening with this. You know, it's it's it just happens to be that it's linear, but that is yeah, that's nice. Um, yeah. So. Ooh, okay. I think we could talk about how it operates because um, this is probably more your area than mine. But uh, um, this is uh, actually not even mine to begin with. But this is something in an area that I expect you to know significantly better than me, even though I really like control systems. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe, maybe I don't know. But uh, yeah, tell <laughs> tell me about it. Tell me. Okay, so I think we go to the next slide. We can talk oh, yes. about Let's um, do it. Hitachi cell track. Ah, cell track. Yeah. Oh yes, of course. Yes, yeah, cell track. So. Um, yeah, now this is we're talking about. Um, so the first picture here is is Skytrain, right? Uh, is 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 oh I don't know, what am I looking at? Let's see. Uh, yeah, the first picture. The, so this picture is is Skytrain, right? Yes, uh, so that's an, that's the operating panel for Skytrain. This was yeah. actually taken during an incident when Skytrain was having some issues with funding, and there was a constant system breakdowns. Um, okay, I yeah. could get it. I can make an entire presentation about what they had to do to fix uh, some of the shortcomings that happened in the early 2010s. But uh, they are completely. Uh, you can drive these trains. It's completely doable. And for regulation purposes, they actually do have to drive them between two stations um, once a month. So they just get an attendant on board. They drive the train between two stations. That'll be. For, check, I guess check. that'll be for knowledge, route knowledge purposes. So everyone has to right drive the train a bit between any given section to make sure that they're. That they that they've yeah. got that experience, so that so that if they have to drive the train manually, they can do. That's yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so it's very DLR then, because the DLR has a little plastic tub that you lift off, and you can drive the train manually if you have to. Um, I oh, actually nice. have a funny story about this. So one time I was trying to take a video of um, the train going through the tunnel, and it slipped out of my hand, and it actually slid behind the panel. Oh, really? 
And so they actually had to take apart the train in oh. order to get my, my mobile phone back. And oh. by that point, I had a brand new phone because I figured it was lost. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah. So, um, right. So, t- 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 give you, give you, yeah. Tell, tell us about what, what you have to say about cell track, and I'll see if I've got anything else okay. to add. I feel, yeah, I feel so that one. This operates on this. All right. I mean, the, right, I'll talk over you. This is the power of the internet and being, you know, seven thousand kilometers away. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, cell track is uh, what actually operates the um, SkyTrain uh, control system. Um, I, from my understanding, it's GOA four or UTO is the way you describe it. This is beyond me but uh, it's the same system that powers the detroit people mover which is on the right and that is actually the same system as skytrain but also powers the dlr and gareth i'm so sorry i did not ride the dlr when i was last in town i do plan to ride it when i'm back in london in three weeks so um yeah, DLR, yeah, so GOA is grade of automation um and, and really what it refers to is um what the people what you have to do on the train um, as a person. So uh, GOA1 is, uh, uh, you know, I, we went into this in the drive episode, driverless episode. In fact, you know, I can jump forward to this episode, the, the episode 104, we went into the details about what GOA means. And um, uh, yeah, GOA4, yeah, DLR, I think it's GOA3 slash 4. It's sort of a little, it straddles them a little bit because hmm. you do, they, like, they do have to have someone on the train because you don't because of the platform train interface issues but it also slightly grandfather rights in that that it, it, it can it, yeah it sort of straddles too but what it means is the train uh, entirely runs itself um uh and the doors are opened by you know all these things it's all entirely sort of self, self-operated it's interesting so so cell track is the system that you that you mentioned so in that mm-hmm. episode we talk about the various different like driverless technologies um so there's the bombardier city flow which is cbtc which people have heard of cell track which you've just referred to which was um talus now hitachi but also as we'll talk about in a second not there's there's demons version of cbtc there's val which is interesting there's hitachi's hitachi rails driverless metro doppelmeyer have a couple of systems don't worry about those too much and then uh nippon signal have uh, the, the the chinese system which is sparks um but yeah so bombardier now alstom but also mm-hmm. um val doesn't exist doppelmeyer systems are not they're not they're not trains um Cell track doesn't exist anymore. That's it's obsolete. I mean, it is out there, obviously, but it's now an obsolete system. Which it, we talk about uh, challenges of of of, of um, proprietary technologies. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So cell track doesn't actually exist anymore. But yeah, it's fine. It's it's fine. It's it's a looped control system. It it, it it's it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely fine. It's, it doesn't have any downsides particularly. It's, it, other than the fact that it is now an obsolete technology. I suppose. Yeah. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to say about self track. No. It's, no. Yeah. I, this is like for me, like because I work with industrial controller used to on a regular basis. I found self track rather fascinating mm. um, many years ago. Um, there was one time where I did a Twitter thread back when Twitter was Twitter, and uh, I've actually been mistaken for an employee of Translink because <laughs> I knew how well the system works, and I was like, no, no, I just work in control systems. I understand how they work i have a strong you're being very kind to say that i might know more about this than you but i have a very strong <laughs> feeling that you have an extremely good knowledge of how cell track works i don't know to be honest I, I, it's an episode in and of itself and actually that twitter thread is probably worth if it's still around worth finding if people are, want to go and dig it out because because yeah go through that and have, have a read of it to understand the system but it's it's looped and and and, and sort of time regulated and uh, yeah you know more about the techno and we're not going to get into the tech now because actually i think th- there are lots of different ways to control trains at higher levels of of, of, of automation um and and uh, it is interesting, but but I don't think it's necessarily a huge amount for us to learn in this situation. Cell track was the system that was picked, right? Um, That's right. So, 11th of December, 1980. We have a date. Uh, mm-hmm. 11th of December, 1985. What happens then? Well, I think people probably can work out what's about to happen. Well, yes, it's the day after my father's birthday. But also, oh. um, it is uh, the day that SkyTrain, which is what it became, um, was launched. Um, this is really great. Two things I'm going to get out of the way is that Initially, the entire system but one station was completely accessible from the start. That station did get an upgrade in 2009 um, to now make the entire system um, uh, fully accessible. That's fantastic, so genuinely. a brand new system <laughs> that is nearly 100% uh, accessible, and now it's 100% accessible. But yeah, this was SkyTrain. It opened months prior to the World's Fair in April. Yep. And, yeah, they got uh, it. They hit the date. There's always a hard problem when you have a hard date. There's always a, a, the likelihood of you succeeding is th- thin. They did it, though. It's great. This this line that was initially open would become the Expo line, which is why I included that on the bottom. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, my, I really like the photo on the top left here. Uh, it shows the SkyTrain going through a banner. Uh, yeah. This is Waterfront Station. And um, keep that photo in mind for the next slide because um, it's it's a little optimistic in the next slide what it would end up looking like. But oh, this really? is... Okay. This is the terminus station. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but it's it's but, uh, what's funny is how little glass there is in the front of the the operational vehicle. Like they've 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 put the two metal panels in with the tiny window and the door. Um, that's quite it's quite interesting. Um, they have to shove the computers somewhere. Though, that's actually. true. There's the, two yeah. rack mountains that sit on both sides. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, also, you're gonna have to explain the steam train. You have to explain the oh, Union Pacific yes. steam so train. During the, during World's Fair, they had something called what was it called Expo Rail. And so outside of Pacific Central Station, which is one of our two rail stations in mm. Vancouver, um, they were doing a rail demonstration, which is where the uh, – I won't actually, I won't say this yet because we'll, this will come out in a few slides. But um, they basically were just showing up trains. And I saw this photo and I went like, oh, that's such a good, it is, good comparison. It is nice because, of course, in the background is the, is the, is the SkyTrain running along in, in the sky, as it were. Beautiful. Mm. So uh, next picture we have – the stations. the stations. These are what they ended up building. This is a typical suburban station. Um, this design has slowly been deprecated as they upgraded the stations, but they've kept some of the theming around it. Um, very simple steel tubing, um, wire mesh screens um, for the uh, for, just to keep people from falling off the tracks, I guess. And um, yeah, this was what the stations looked like back in 1985. It's it's nice. I, they look nice. I've I've just done a little bit of color adjustment actually to 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 sort of show it in a, it's slightly more like what what the actual colors would look like. So it's a very yellow photo, but the um it's a, it's a nice photo. But um but yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's a bit of a it's a little bit high tech. It's a little bit of pomo. There's it's it's you know it's not taking itself entirely seriously, but it's functional. It's it, it's there are features that are slightly extraneous which is good that's fun to put things in that make it go look it's a thing look look hey look everyone nearby it's a it's a thing that you, you your th your trains are in this thing uh, it's good i like it uh it's nice mm. and um oh some very concept very art. nice concept art <laughs> hello so the left is um kind of nice but uh would never pass seismic uh, requirements um because we are an earthquake prone city Okay, um, we're yeah. due for an 8.0 at some point. Hopefully, never. Um, but on the right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots um, of single by that lots of single columns, like lot, lots of single columns that are very bad in earthquakes, which is a thing that you just avoid in earthquake prone areas. Yeah. Um, but on the right, that's a waterfront station, and if you may remember from earlier, I was saying it's rather dark down there. This is what they were hoping to build. Um, there's no way they were going to build it because there's an active rail yard to the left of the, that particular image. Yep. So not going to happen. Yeah. But anyway, I just thought these were neat to show. They are nice. That's that's very nice and light and airy. And I like the industrial the connection straight into the industrial building. To this, it's, it's nice. It's nice. Uh, but alas, um, but this is what the underground stations look like. Yeah, it, it's it's a station. It's an underground station. It's does what it says picked, on the tin. Yeah. And I picked this in particular because you notice the rooftops. Yes. One's curved and one's flat. Yes. Yeah, so one tunneled one cut and cover what's tell me what's going well, on here cut, cuts over to the next uh slide and you'll see what i'm talking about so this is the same station although um this is concept art so it's not exactly one-to-one -one, but you may have noticed the trains go run on top of on top of each other this is oh, was yes. cut and cover but this was actually originally a rail tunnel that was used for the canadian pacific so they could bypass um, the city center and go to the other like to the other rail yard and so they abandoned that tunnel at some point and so the city bought the tunnel to and then split the tunnel in half that's nice and then ran the trains on top so i get they might have done a bit of expanding of the tunnel but when you have it's very useful yeah. to have an existing tunnel to start with because <laughs> you just have to expand that existing space uh, and you know Mersey Rail did this you know Mersey Rail have done this a few times where they had the existing old you know like Victorian tunnel and and then just dropped the floor of that tunnel down to to match up the levels and make it all work and, and um but this is a very neat solution because you, yeah if you've got a big North American gauge tunnel there there is space to double deck that for for a neat little passenger uh, loading gauge. That's very and that yeah okay. So let's go back to the previous picture. That explains this shape because mm -hmm. here is the bottom one, bottom, bot, and here's the top one, top, and uh, down here is up here. There we go. That's very nice. I like that. Yeah, it's, uh, very simple. Very simple. Lovely. Um, ooh, 
Okay. And that's uh, that's the one station that they actually did not have to. They actually had to build. Um, like the other two stations that are downtown, actually three, really. Um, actually, I won't want to talk about the other one actually at all. But like this station in particular, they actually had to dig a hole down to the bottom, and they had to build a brand new station house for this. And um, the there's a station that's about 600 meters um, to the east that was just built into an existing Hudson's Bay Company building. Ah, interesting. So, okay, yeah. So this station's really nice. Um, I, if you're in Vancouver and you want it, and you come here during the spring, like around when cherry blossoms are coming out, there are tons of cherry blossom trees just surrounding this oh. station. I mean, it's, I mean, that sounds beautiful, but also it looks beautiful. Again, it's this this sort of um, high tech architecture approach with all this, the external scaffolding. It's it's very, um, uh, yeah, it's very um, uh, Grimshaw. It, it's it's nice. It's it's got that um, it's got that look to it. It's nice. But also, it's the same architectural language as that um, overhead station that we saw a couple of slides back. It's sort of similar, yeah. similar so visual hired, language. Uh, they hired a firm from Aust- uh, from Austria to actually yeah. uh, build it. So from what I understand is some of the design language is borrowed from um, some S-Bahn, U- U-Bahn that is in Austria, but I don't remember which one. It's really nice. I like it. And the fact that it's this this one seems quite nicely stitched into the city from what I can see. The fact that it's got trees outside is really nice. There's some nice urban mm-hmm. realm. That's lovely. I, I really like that. Um, yeah. Oh, it's nice to have having had several depressing episodes. It's nice to have a nice episode. This is lovely. <laughs> um, okay, next next slide. We have a, a very different bit of structure here. This is my favorite building in all the city. Um, this is Waterfront Station, originally built for the Canadian Pacific Railway in 1916 or 1919. I can't remember when it was finished. Um, this building was almost demolished for that freeway system I was talking about, but they did not. And instead, um, the provincial government um, uses it, uh, originally used it for a sea bus service, which is a ferry that goes to the North Shore. It's still an active service, but now services two SkyTrain lines, the West Coast Express, and of course that aforementioned ferry. Um, it's not owned by TransLake, really annoyingly, so you oh. can kind of tell when you walk in there. But um, TransLake has, um, you know, a very long lease on it. I wouldn't be surprised if they end up owning this building at some point. But yeah, it's it's a gorgeous building and it just stands out. And I, every time I go inside of it, I'm super happy. It's it's really interesting actually because I mean you've got the star, standard sort of Greco-Roman features, you know, the the, the kind of the neoclassical stuff. But there's some, it's it's it, it's quite nicely monolithic. You know, I I I quite like it's not overly ornate which I, i'm not actually a huge fan of like overly ornate sort of neoclassical stuff this is nice actually it's quite it's quite a nice it's, it's a very obviously big civic building there with purpose it's it's lovely um oh diana spotted <laughs> so yeah um we had a royal visit during um i just felt like throwing this in there because i wanted to say <laughs> that the king has rode read the sky train before oh god he's um, the king isn't he that's oh, embarrassing to have to be reminded of <laughs> i'm I sorry he's our king too <laughs> he is your king yeah we have a king there's a king there's a guy who's called king i that, know oh, right we love gross him. um <laughs> we so this is patterson station um you could give you an idea what the stations look like on the interior um and he's meeting with, I want to say it's the transport minister um, and the premier of British Columbia, who would have been Bill Vanderson, I think, at the time. Transport minister would have been Rita Johnson, something like that. Um, this train is weird. You'll see it's number 14. This has been used in movies. Oh. It has been used to have uh, Thailand's Princess Chula born um, ride on 1989, which is why Bangkok has a SkyTrain system. It's likely the reason why it's called that is because she rode this train. Huh. And... Maggie Thatcher also has ridden this uh, train as well. Oh, now, what year did she ride this train? It would have been 1986. So I know that the DLR had already been... It um, had, yeah, okay. Because I was going to say, is this a thing that inspired... But no, it sounds, to be fair, okay. It sounds like actually it was already happening by that point. And and in fact, 86 operating by that point, actually? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it would have been. Um, So... Oh, God. I mean, he's always looked like a gross old man, hasn't he? Uh... I mean, you Diana. Really I'm King no Chucky. fan of Diana. She was. I'm, I'm no fan of Diana. She was a. a she, she was a, a rich toff. But you know, she's 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 looking. She's you know she's she's dressed. Yeah, you know, she's 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 wearing an outfit. You know, the hair is nice. She looks yeah. nice. Um, I, although I have to say, absolute hero outfit from the. Who did you say the the lady behind Diana here is? Uh, uh, I want to say that's Rita Johnson, the transport minister. But the only problem is I haven't been able to figure this out. It's really it's I, um, somebody who knows better than me. With turning up dressed that me. way when Diana's coming, turning up, realizing there's no point competing on like 
like uh, hot couture. No, no, no. What you need to do is just go fucking absolutely a blast on. I'm wearing the brightest dress that I have. I'm putting an enormous red ribbon on my hat, and I'm going to look absolutely awesome. And uh, fair play, she's killing it. I'm actually and massive beads on around the neck. I, I I'm not being mocking. I'm being quite serious. That's an absolutely <laughs> that's a, 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 like queen shit right there. I love that outfit. Yeah. Um, very the only nice. thing it could be is it could be our lieutenant governor, the guy on the on the left going down the escalator, but it's hard to tell. The guy that this. I, he, that guy also has vi- there's there's some vibes going on in this there's there's, some, there's there's he is a kind of guy that right there uh yeah yeah crikey anyway right and i don't have to dwell on this that's kind of there's some fun photos there uh number 14 i wonder if it's because they put bulletproof glass in car 14 or something i don't know like i i, I wonder i wonder why everyone uses car 14 over all the others maybe it's just accidentally the one that ends up getting used it's probably going to be one of the ones that's preserved because it has plaques on it uh, indicating um, that, you know, the Prince and Princess of Wales was on it and then the Princess of and Thailand And they don't want to whatever. preserve more than one car, so they always make sure it's the same car every time. So they can say, all the yeah. famous people have ridden in this car. Yeah, okay, makes sense. So ha- this system, I presume, is doing, by this point, doing pretty well. So it's time to make it bigger, right? Yeah, well, the thing is, is Skytrain's adoption was not without its critics. Um, the opposition, being the NDP, hated it. And there are a lot of urban pundits who thought that operating a LRT like what is seen in Calgary or Edmonton would be a better investment. Um, Calgary and Edmonton use uh, basically something similar to the Siemens trains from earlier, although yeah. they're high floor and all this sort of thing. Um, but nearly every proposal for expansion in this region has been met with a goddamn LRT system instead of a SkyTrain. Trams are and- trams. This is why I fight. That, so light rail doesn't exist. This LRT stuff, these are just trams. And it's really important that everyone knows these are just trams. They're just trams. The trams are fantastic. They are terrific. But they're trams. They're designed to yeah. be on streets. They are to, they are to complement and, and basically augment buses. They are not a thing... They, are, they should not be seen. This is where the not a matter of sorter is important. They are not to be seen as a comp, as a thing that can be used instead of metro systems. They are very, very different. Tell Ottawa or Seattle to tell you to <laughs> uh, Toronto. Yeah, the whole lot. Um, I'm, I'm hating on Toronto. I'm, I'm, maybe, I, don't, I don't know what the beef, whether there's any decent beef between Vancouver and Toronto, but uh, there ought to be. Oh, it's legendary. Oh, good. In which case, yeah, Toronto, you suck. Vancouver is doing everything right. Um <laughs> Yeah, I have friends in Toronto. They might, they may actually go like, "What the hell?" <laughs> hi, hi, everyone, Toronto. I'm sure you're all lovely, but uh, no, um, your your government is not doing good. It's not there. There are some great things happening in transport there, but some of the decisions are silly, um, like spending metro money on a tram. I every single tram they've built there for the last ten years. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, hi, so hi, hi, Toronto people. I will see, I'll give you some good news. Um, every time they try to bring in LRT into this uh, region, um, it just gets squashed. Yes. Um, so the first, the SkyTrain mainline has been, ext- uh, well, I'm going to call the Expo line just to keep it simple moving yeah. forward. The Expo line has been extended uh, a couple of times, um, but not very far. So about 600 meters was the initial uh, extension and then another four kilometers after that. If you look at the um, photo in the center, that's the sky bridge. Um, for a while, like about, for a while, uh, for about uh, 29 years, it was the longest cable supported rapid transit bridge in the world until China built one. Oof, um, nice. It's, it's very fetching. It is, but I'm going to make a complaint about it in the next slide uh, because uh, they are, they are going to be extending this line further, about 16 kilometers um, into Surrey and then Langley. Uh, yeah, we have a Surrey, and it has a Guildford, by the way, if you want to know about strange <laughs> things about places here. And uh, that will end up creating, uh, making the Expo line as long as the Northern line. Hmm. Uh, which, is, which is good, fine. But um, yeah, I, well, it, yeah. Um, it might create problems, I, I know. <laughs> it might create problems, yeah. Uh, so yeah, lots of, so, so we've got lots of pictures here. We've got pictures of like modern suggestions for alternatives of... So this is a tram uh, here on the left-hand side. Uh, here is um, the Sky Bridge with the Sky Train on it. Uh, here. Oh, that's actually the vehicle that I was mentioning earlier. That was one of the test vehicles that was brought for 1983 and was modified to have six doors. Oh, interesting. So it's actually extended. Oh. Um, they sent it back. I don't know what happened oh, with it. Oh, boo. Uh, then you've got um, – so there's, there's, there's a picture here in the middle showing West Coast Express Millennium Line. We'll get to that in a minute. Yes. Um, and on the right hand side, you've got yet another uh, light rail mock-up here. 
Um, yeah. And again, showing uh, it's two neat pictures just going, look how easy you can install the thing, which those pictures are actually going, look how annoying this thing is to get to and how yeah. hostile it is for people actually using it when you're basically going, well, we've got a highway, we'll shove an LRT down the middle. Yeah, what you've done there is create something that no one can get to in any nice way. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, down with that. Uh, next slide, some more bridges. Wow, sir. This should this was one of the proposed bridges. I would have preferred to have seen this over a cable uh, supported bridge. It's such a nice looking bridge, and they didn't build it. I just wanted to put it in there to have my soapbox. <laughs> Why didn't they build that? Like cable state is fine, but it's so boring. This is sexy as hell. Look at this. I know. Oh, line go down, then line go up. That's it's perfect. Oh, I like that a lot. That's it makes. I'm sad that wasn't built. Um, and gee, they've gone hard on the caissons to make sure this thing doesn't get booped. Um, very nice. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, right, we have to talk about West Coast Express. Yeah, I'm going to this, this is a very different thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just heavy rail. It was introduced in 95. Um, it only operates like five or six trains uh, into Vancouver in the morning and then five or six trains out of Vancouver towards Mission. That's about 75 kilometers. It interchanges a SkyTrain at three stations. Um, so you don't. it's not just primarily a destination, just a downtown. I wish it was regional rail. That's kind of my complaint, but I threw it in there because it was the only um, new service for rail transport in Vancouver for uh, a good oh, well, 15 years, right? So, What's the distance of this thing? Could this be converted into SkyTrain? No, it's it couldn't because it's 75 kilometers. Uh, distance is too... Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, could it be partially... Con- because I, I suppose what I'm thinking is, is like... Um, this that so, frequency is rubbish yes. like that's a, that's such a rubbish like it's very much like commuter rail in the sense of you've got a few trains that you might catch in the morning and then you catch them back but that's that's fine for people who work nine to five but it's useless as a form of actual like um public transport technology for people who aren't commuting if you can convince the powers that be at canadian pacific oh don't do that no just be far 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 easier to fully nationalize them uh anyway yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah screw those guys so that was west coast express and the millennium line next yes so finally, we get a second line in the city. Um, this almost ended up being light rail, but um, the NDP government, which hated um, SkyTrain for the longest time, had it about um, face on this yes, and uh, decided to adopt um, SkyTrain, and which is was now Bombardier's uh, ART system. Yep. And so they opened an initial demonstration extension in early 2020, sorry, 20, 2002, excuse me. And the entirety of the original 14 kilometers of track was open in August of that year. And what they initially did is they used to interline it with the Expo line. Um, This proved to be a problem for a long time because if there was disruptions on any of the lines, it created a cascading effect across the network. Yeah. But um, there was an extension uh, eventually built uh, one kilometer to the east uh, in 2006. And then in 2016, um, they built in a 10 kilometer extension towards Lafarge Lake Douglas. Uh, bringing the whole line to 25 kilometers. And then they ended that interlining um, situation, meaning that the Expo good. line and the Millennium line only interacted with two stations. It's very good to run lines like this. When you've got high-intensity services like this, keep them segregated as their own line. Operationally, it makes everything so much easier because if you've got mm-hmm. hell on one, you don't want to create hell on the other. Like You'll already have hell from passengers being stuck at your stations and stuff. The last thing you want is actual connected operational hell. And so we, I was talking earlier about the... Um, well, we were both talking earlier about the um, the wayfinding. Uh, and here's a nice here's a nice example of that. It's definitely Officina. That's, that's surely that's Officina. Surely, surely, surely. ITC Officina, uh, SANS. Um, uh, and it looks like a medium... That looks medium to me, but it's a mixture. But yeah, it's obviously, and it's quite nice. It's quite neat. Um, and, and this is similar to the, I mean, to be fair, it's, it's quite a ubiquitous way of doing things. It's not that necessarily that underground influence, but it's kind of got that nod. But it looks nice. It's, it's neat. It's tidy. Mm. Good wayfinding is important. Um, it seems that there is quite good unified branding across the system as well. There's like quite a good... Um, the candle line's an exception, but I will explain that in a moment uh, okay. why the candle okay. line is unique. But... Uh, we can show some photos of the stations as well. Oh, here. yeah. So, yeah, like, okay. this is uh, what you typically got, get inside. Yeah, they're a bit more uh, standard. Um, they're, they're a bit more kind of standard 2000s fair type, uh, type, type thing. In, in a way, less interesting and less unique than the than the Expo line. But, uh, mm-hmm. but still, you know, light, airy, fine. Absolutely fine. So, what makes these stations, the original stations, stand out is they actually added art pieces into every uh, station. Oh, nice. And this one in particular is at Sapperton Station. Uh, which is now actually on the Expo line, because when they changed everything around, they just made this extent uh, of a spur of the Expo line. Ah. I miss this uh, piece of art. It's still there, but what used to be is um, there's a shaft that would run from these two wheels all the way to where the uh, 
what is now Gates. We got um, Station Gates back in 2013. I'm not going to talk about them, but um, <laughs> yeah. the. Uh, there used to be a bicycle on the other end, and oh. you could pedal the bicycle, oh. and you can make these wheels spin, and you can see the phases of the moon. That's lovely. I love art in public transport systems. I don't love it just in a, that's nice. I love it in a, it should be an absolutely, it should be considered an absolutely integral part of a viable public transport system is incorporating public art into it. Art on the underground is wonderful, but but not as funded as I'd like it to be. Um, art is so important because these things like the railways are part of our culture as much as they're part of our lifeblood and it's important that they that people own them people understand people feel that they are their own along with all the other good stuff about supporting local artists and, and such and such but this is lovely i, I like that there's there's hmm. there's a, a really shonky series of like kind of slightly sciencey but also de very much art installations at denmark hill station near my mother-in-law in south london and they're lovely there's a little lift that like brings a marble up and then it drops down and you can and it's there's a few little things like they're nice they're lovely they're really it's important to have art in your as well as the station itself being built to be beautiful or or at least have a, a, a pleasing form which is an integral part of its functionality uh, are important sorry i'll get off my soapbox there's a lot of soapboxes <laughs> this episode is about learning and we're learning things I, I i like art on uh, public transport systems so the canada line you've alluded to it it's a very bold it's a very bold name to name your public transit line after the country that you that, that you reside in but they they went they went they went there um so, politics <laughs> yeah tell us about the canada line and what what's going on with it and why it is different before i start do you notice anything different about the tracks uh it's missing is it missing oh yeah there's a there's a third rail elevated is it missing it's also missing it's um uh it's not maglev i said it's not got the 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 linear induction plate in the middle is that right yeah so <laughs> so this is why it's political there's a lot of politics around this one so this was open in 2009, just in time for the Olympics the following year. The only similarity, like I said, is uh, to the rest of the network is the rail gauge and um, the control and install, that sort of thing. Yep. It's also not operated by the BC Rapid Transit Company, which oh, is that's, the... It's cheap. It's, it's one that, that was, that's the company that operates the um, Expo Millennium Line. It's a subsidiary of TransLink. But instead, by... Pro Trans BC, and while I very appreciate, very much appreciate the name, yeah, it's great name, not it's a great name, except it's a subsidiary of Atkins Realis, or I'm sure you heard this name, uh, SNC Lavalin. Yeah, I used to work for Atkins. My first company I worked for was Atkins. That that yeah. then then SNC Lavalin bought it to wash to 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 wash the blood and or corruption scandal out of their name, uh, failed yeah. <laughs> to, and then have sold it off again. Uh, and now it's Atkins, but because to nod to the Canadian connection, they've called out. Or did they sell it off, or they just renamed SNC Lavalin to call it Atkins Realis? In any case, they, they just they just call it Atkins Realis. So now. they realised that SNC Lavalin's name is still dirt. So they've yeah they've changed it to just be called Atkins Realis, and they've made the name. Mm -hmm. And it looks like um, a NAF font that you'd find like deep in the deep in the darkest depths of Windows ninety five um, uh, PowerPoint that they've used for the logo. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so a shout out to all my friends and colleagues uh, who are at Atkins. Uh, hi. Why do you own this? This should be owned by. You the might actually Trans know a friend of mine. I know. I'll, I'll talk about you. I'll ask you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. Um, but um, here it is. I'm annoyed that it isn't. So I don't mind so much that it's not the same because it's it's the same gauge, both track and loading gauge. So in a way, it, oh, it's I'm not, not the same loading gauge. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Fair point. <laughs> It's the same track gauge, at least. So that's something yes. that they're allowed. That, 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 so that in a way, it's like, okay, I'm, I can't get too angry about the technology choice. But it, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you continue. There's also some Olympics pictures here, which gives some context. As, anyway, but no, I don't like that this is run by a private consortium. Like, no, it should be run by the it, same. It is a P3 project. Yeah, we, I love, we all love a P3, don't we? Gross. Um, so Bombardier was excluded from the project for political reasons, so ART was never an option. Um, <sighs> it was also originally supposed to be an LRT, but uh, it was eventually squashed in favor of this. So a so, win and a loss there. Uh, yeah, okay. There was all sorts of names originally, and they were going to call it the Olympic line, but then that was not taken. That was actually used for a demonstration tram line that was run during um, uh, the 2010 Olympics, which I didn't include in here. Um, but... 
The uh, line itself, though, is actually quite useful. It connects Vancouver and uh, to Richmond. We have a Richmond. And yeah. uh, it also connects to Vancouver International Airport uh, to the west. So it's about a 19-kilometer line. What is really um, uh, great about this is Vancouver became the first city in Canada to actually have rail service to its airport. Yeah, <laughs> yes. which is a fundamental requirement for any useful airport. But, um, yeah, daft that it took this long. But, uh, no, it's good. That is good. So it's a good line. It's just that it's a, it's a stupid P3. It's a P3. PFI project. It's a public-private partnership, um, and it didn't need to be. It didn't need to be. It could no. have just been built and paid for in the same way the other lines were, and it would have been integrated with those, and um, that would have been good because you could share a lot of staff who understand the system. Anyway, lots of reasons why that's annoying, but I'm not super angry about this because, firstly, you can buy it out. I mean, okay, yeah, this is much more expensive than if they just invested themselves and paid for it that way. But also, it is, it's not like it's something completely proprietary. So that, in a way, it's good that it's not, like, it is standard track gauge. Yes, there are loading gauge differences, but at least it is, like, broadly a similar specification to the other lines. And it's not, it's not a tram, which is also good. Mm -hmm. If you go to the next slide, you can yes. see some of the stations. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, so there's one big annoyance about this. I'll talk about the first one, and I can show this here. Um, the platforms are significantly shorter on the on this uh, on this line. Okay, so I annoying. mentioned that the Expo Millennium line have 80 meter platforms. Yep. Um, these stations have anywhere between 40 and 50 meter platforms. Why didn't they make them all 80? Oh, that's annoying. Yep, that's very annoying. Well, cheap is why PFI they value engineer yep. out. They go well. Our specification only requires us to have the capacity for the you know the um the, the the turnaround of our contract, which is you know like 30 years or whatever. Some 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 stuff. I don't know what it actually will be. Might be less. 25 so, years, say. And so we don't need to deal with potential future capacity. We just need this much. And so 50 meters is fine. That annoys so me. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you the other problem. <laughs> what do you see here? One. Tr what one track what what's one track so this is a terminus station one of two terminus stations the other one um there's a third terminus station that actually does have two tracks weirdly uh what they decided to do is at the airport they gave it a single track for the terminus now i can sort of understand that because they gave it a pocket track for the trains to um stable at or whatever okay yeah uh, you can't really go further west because it'll just end up in the ocean but this is actually the southerly most uh, terminus of the Canada line at Richmond Brick House, and it only has one platform, and that's it. And there, even though there is plenty of people living south of this line, they'll probably, if they ever decide to expand it, they're going to have to do some well, they're gonna extra have to flatten the station. They're going to have to bulldoze the station, uh, potentially, or they go to the, you know, they can go leftwards this way, I suppose. But but that's a bad choice. It's a bad choice for a couple of reasons, like single platform uh, terminate, terminations. Trains take a bit of time to terminate. So if you end up, we talked earlier about 70 second headways. If you want to maintain those kind of headways, you need you need at least two tracks to terminate because you need to overlap your terminations. Um, that's a whoops right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't like that. So we did avoid one thing because um, I've done showing all the SkyTrain, but let's. Uh, I, I really want to show this off because I, I think mind, I, you're in for a treat. Yeah, I, I don't mind the um, architecture for the stations, though. I think that is quite smart. They're, they're, they're they, they do look nice. They do. I like a bit of big, big bare concrete. Makes me quite happy. So, um, oh yeah. So we have to talk about the future. Didn't the future that did not happen? The future brackets didn't happen. Oh boy. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're getting the double sad horn for the double um, the double pacer here. In regional railways livery and looking very nice, actually. <laughs> it's looking very smart, actually. It's a class 142. And, oh boy, junk. What, I'm so sorry we sent this to you. Why is this in your city? <laughs> so, for Expo 86, um, British Rail did send us um, this lovely set of uh, pacers and offered 50 kilometer demonstration rides from New Westminster to Abbotsford. So uh, basically just south of where the West Coast Express terminates. And they used an old BCER line, which has mandates for passenger rail. And I have a question for you, because you're hmm. gonna be familiar with these vehicles, because um, I have only seen one in person. I saw one in crew once, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I've never had the pleasure of riding on one. Um, they operated them on a 2% grade or 1 in 50. How would a pacer like that? Um, not well. The, the, there are lots of... The, so it's, these are funny little things. They're, they're, they're like a thought experiment that on a napkin that should never have been followed through with. 
Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do an episode on... We've done an episode on how paces are bad. We will do an episode on, like... Well, in that one, we talked about where they came about. In any case, um, th- the trouble with that is that these aren't hugely powerful to start with, and they also don't have that many wheels to put the traction power through, which means that gradients can be a challenge for these little things. Uh, they are light, but they're also not hugely well-powered, so I'm going to go with grades not so great. Um, yeah. Uh, if you show yeah. the next photo, you'll see how warmly received these trains were. Oh. So here, here it is with a with an out of service sticker on the side, kind of it seems dumped in a rail yard, among a lot of Canadian national stock, um, and some bud cars on the right hand side as well, which is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. it's a via rail train. I actually got to ride one of those a couple of weeks ago. Oh, lovely. So th- that seems like, I mean, did we send this thing to you? Is it still over there? Where's it gone? What what's what's happened to it? Where is it now? So I, I know it was used. It might have been used as a demonstration for Philly because I think Philly. Oh, was this the one did. that ended up down at Philly as well? Golly. Yeah, but this particular train was sent back and was in operation until when it was retired in oh, what, really? tw- 2022 or whatever it was. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. The there was a joke I read once that said Canadians would rather ride a moose. Canadians would rather ride a moose. Yeah, I mean they are bouncy. They, you see from the intro music, they like to bounce. Um, yeah, what a mess. Good grief. So that's the pacer. And um, I, I think rightly, people, people, people who love pacers don't deserve happiness. Um, people, who, <laughs> people who say that pacers saved anything uh, don't understand how history works. And um, yeah, they're, they're just awful, awful, awful vehicles. Uh, it was an accident. They should never have got as far as they did. Um, but we have to talk about something even more fun. Because, oh boy, well, if you've got a system that uses linear induction, then why not take that the next step and make it Star Trek? <laughs> so this is the only time that Vancouver has had maglev. Toronto did have a maglev demonstration as well. Uh, 400 meters of track were built for Expo 86. And from what I understand, this car is now on display somewhere in Japan. Oh. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, but there was video floating about it on YouTube. Um, and I just thought this was kind of neat and I threw this in. So we did get maglev ultimately. Yeah, I, like it's yeah, it's ugh, maglev. Uh, I have lots of thoughts on maglev, but they're all mostly in a video that I did years ago uh, in purple. That the, it's probably still mostly on the homepage of the channel, the YouTube channel somewhere. But um, yeah, uh, it's fun to have that. But the, what I like is the fact that you, that this the SkyTrain, it, well, two thirds of SkyTrain. Let's put it that way. Well, no, it is all SkyTrain, but like two thirds of the system of which SkyTrain is a major constituent. Um, uh, is using linear induction. That's I, I, I kind of like that uh, for aforementioned reasons. It's, it's kind of neat. Um, so now we have to talk about the future brackets might happen. Uh, you've alluded yeah. to this a little bit, but um, let's put the big map up and uh, talk about the future rapid transit network. What what yeah. are the what are the opportunities we've got here? So some good news is you'll see a line that's going to the bottom right and a straight line that is going to start construction sometime early next year. A lot of the movement of power like power poles and that sort of thing have been already commenced um this is going to give the line 16 kilometers of extra trackage it's uh a line that's been bantered about for a long time it was one of the lines that was originally proposed as an lrt if you notice to slightly to its left there's a little l shape there that is a rapid bus that was the original plan for uh transit expansion there they did not Ah, go through with it because they correctly identified that they didn't need to build this first yes also, that um, if you're having these distances, LRT useless. Like Manchester's yep. Metrolink is a bad is, is is kind of to the point where I'd almost describe it as a bad system now because it's too big and way too slow. Uh, particularly if you're wanting to go through the city centre to the other side, it, it's just not the right system. Uh, and and so I'm glad that it's being built as as metro. Nice. And then on the left, just uh, beneath where um, the yellow line that's going off to the left there. That is the line that has been largely constructed by now. So that's the one that had about six kilometers of uh, underground uh, rail being built. Um, The entire tunneling system is done. Um, But now they're just building the stations. It should be open by 2028. So is this through Mount Pleasant and South Granville to... uh, Is this this bit here that we're looking at? Yeah, okay. So the extension of the yellow line from, from from, from VCC Clark through to... Uh, Arbutus. Arbutus, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Nice. So that that's opening soon, um, in the next three years. Um, it's been delayed. COVID got in the way and all that fun stuff. 
but those are the two active projects. Now, there are talk of uh, building uh, more projects. So, in, for example, you'll see a purple line that goes across the top. Uh... Very, very top. Oh, okay. Uh, no, wait. It goes across the water. Oh, this thing. Oh, yeah, this, this, this little bit here. This. Yes. Okay, yeah. So that, that is the sea bus. It's a ferry. And... Yep. Uh, it's uh, been, it's been around since before SkyTrain. It opened in 1977-78, and you'll see there's a green line to the top of it. Um, that is one of the proposals for building a um, SkyTrain system to go across it. Now, <clears throat> there's all sorts of other things off in the future. Um, so basically, um, what the provincial government did in the last election is they did promise transit expansion. So this is one of them. Um, there's also been talk about building regional rail. Thankfully, thank mm. God. Um, but uh, this new project would link um, the North Shore, which is West Vancouver and North Vancouver, to Vancouver, either through Burnaby or through a whole bunch of things. But if you move to the next slide, you'll see one of the little problems we have with this region. We have a giant inlet. Water, or as the Philadelphians would say, and I don't know why they're, they're saying this, but that's because I've been speaking to quite a few Philadelphians recently. Uh, water. Uh, yes. Yeah. Problems. D this. <laughs> deep so, water yeah so you can see there's a port to the right there and it's um, one of like there's three major ports in metro vancouver making um this region extremely important to canada in terms of um yeah. you know the major movement. pacific facing uh sort of uh port port infrastructure yeah. right yeah yeah but it's very deep so that's yep. why it's very good for this so there have been many proposals to build a road tunnel underneath all of this. They have since kind of died off. Nobody is ever seriously um, uh, suggesting this anymore. But uh, there is plans to build um, SkyTrain across it using one of two points um, in this inlet. There's two narrows. They call it the first and second narrows. And eventually uh, there will be a SkyTrain uh, link to the other side. Uh, when would that be built? I don't know, but uh, the provincial government has been serious about building it. There's been many plans been put out, and uh, it might include rebuilding um, a bridge for the Trans-Canada Highway, which is the one freeway that does go into the city limits, uh, and then incorporating a rail bridge into it as well. Yeah, that's yeah. I suppose, I mean, politically, that might make it easier to do as well, but yeah, I wonder if they could just hijack the existing bridge and do it on that instead. But anyway, so, so they did consider it, and um, what they discovered is it wouldn't be seismically uh, feasible. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a fair point. It's a thing that we don't often have to think about as much over on uh, on this side of the. Um... So the water is a challenge, but there are plans to get past it, which which is really good. So okay, yeah. right. So this is the last. Let's tell you what. I'm going to move some images around on this on this slide. But the, this is our last image. And uh, yeah. our last slide in, in, in this tale. Firstly, before we, before you finish off the discussion, and I'll say a proper thank you at the end, but this would be great. I've enjoyed this a lot. So tell us about... Wait a minute. I've just realized what we're looking at here. Two Royal Oak stations. Tell it, what, What's going on yeah. with these two Royal Oak stations here? So I like looking at station name pairs. I think it's kind of fun to do that. Um, there are many um, out there with the SkyTrain system itself. However, um, there's only one with the London Underground, and that's Royal Oak. And I just inadvertently was on the Hammersmith and City line when I was, um, I think it was actually the day after I last saw you. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I just, just passing through, it's like, oh, shit, this is, excuse me, I didn't mean to swear. <laughs> oh, don't, it's a sweary I, episode, don't worry, we can swear on real now, it's fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I just went, oh, wait, this is that Royal Oak station I knew about, so I had to take a photo. And so... I just like station name pairs. There's only uh, on the net on network rail. I think there's only one other station um, pair, and that is Lincoln, oh, yeah. which is okay, like yeah. somewhere up in Scotland or something. Uh, no, Link Lincoln. No, Lincoln is in Lincoln in 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 the, the city of Lincoln in Lincolnshire. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, that it's funny. Yeah, Lincoln. I mean, it's a city apparently, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's so when when you have Canada and you have three million people in a metro area, it's quite funny that like Lincoln is like a, a an unknown village, but it's, yeah, it's uh, no, it's a cathedral city, I, I believe. Like, everyone's going to okay. shout at me when it isn't. Yeah, no, it's funny. It's uh, it's a little. I mean, it's it's kind of yeah. It's it's one of those forgotten places in the east of England, though, in that flat area that no one ever goes to on the kind of the the, the flat, funny shaped tummy of England that that everyone ignores because the wrong side of the East Coast mainline. Um, Royal, yeah, it's a nice pair. Carry on. right? Okay, I, I tell you, we'll come. We'll do my round in a bit. I am first of all, though, of course, going to 
in fact, do this. I'm going to make our giant faces. No, that's my face. Wrong face. No, that's... <laughs> there we go. Professional episode as ever. Carrie, thanks so much. We will come back and I'll say a proper thank you. But that's been fascinating. You know, what, what I suppose the, the way to round off is what, what can we learn from this? Well, we've learned loads, actually. I can't even remember all the things we've learned. We've learned about, like, art on, on public transport systems. We've learned about proprietary technologies. We've learned about why light rail is not the solution and that, that these technologies are good and, and the benefits of them. We've learned... Um, about doing little trial construction bits and getting people interested in buying into their technologies. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's great. I have to ask a question, which is, do you have, out of your window, do you have visibility of a transit system out of your... <laughs> Yes, um, this is um, this was just a happy accident. Um, during COVID, um, I ended up moving and uh, I ended up landing this apartment, and um, it is 100 meters away from a station. So I rarely like I do own a car. I will admit that I do own a vehicle, um, but um, I only too. drive it maybe a thousand kilometers a year. So did a SkyTrain just go past your window then? That's correct. Yeah. Hey! Oh, what? A fun, okay, fun, absolutely terrific. What a beautiful way for me to then go. <laughs> I love that. It's so good. And it's to say that um, uh, this is in available uh, in audio only format. It's a it's it's a it's a longer one, but you know what? I'm glad we gave it a bit of time because it's a really really interesting subject. Um, and that Karen, that was uh, I, I'll say a proper thanks at the end. That was, uh, I, but I've I've have a terrific fun. Um, sorry, I'm late with the uploads at the moment, but I'm extremely disorganized and panicked and uh, full of anxiety with all the just chaos that's going on in my life right now. But uh, it's mostly the the, the the one person show that is this episode is Rail Natter is sort of mostly holding itself together. Um, uh, the usual plugs, garethdennis.co.uk slash merch for the merchandise, garethdennis.co.uk slash discord for the chat, hello chat, for the chat to, inc- uh, to continue ad infinitum, paypal.me slash garethdennis for loose change and abuse, and of course, my patrons, my dear patrons, patreon.com slash garethdennis to support this and all the other nonsense that I get up to is, as all the patrons always say to me, they, they support this for Rail Natter, they are patron supporters for Rail Natter, but also for just generally helping me to do all the other nonsense that I get up to, whether it's pestering lords or, uh, you know, generally, you know, pushing pushing the book out and making people buy the book, all this sort of good stuff. Um, so thank you to them. Um, WTYP, of course, I'm a co-host of WTYP at the moment, um, which when I look back on this, when I hopefully get a job and will be able to very it would say uh, to the three dear original hosts, well, actually, I suppose there were two original hosts, but actually these are the the, the God Squad lineup, right? Um, and say thank you and thanks so much for the support. But um, I'll, I'll look back very fondly on my time as a co-host. And we did a recording last night and we just laughed the whole time. So it was a tremendous ep- fun episode. Um, so uh, go and go and listen to that. It's, it's good fun. And, and give, also give them, give them whatever support you can not necessarily financially, even just say WTYP, we love you. That's nice. And also book tickets to the to the Philly show because the, the Fillmore, uh, we need to fill more. Um, but that's not the only plug. There is another plug. We need to talk about Schoenigan Moments. Um, Carrie, tell us about your podcast. <laughs> yeah, so um, t- I am one half of Schoenigan Moments with my uh, friend and co-host uh, Tamarack. We are currently going through all of the Heritage Minutes. If you ever heard of a Heritage Minute, um, these are uh, one-minute uh, videos that uh, are aired on Canadian television about various aspects of Canadian history. And uh, we are going through every single one of them and talking about the actual history because you're not going to know oh, everything yeah. in one minute. <laughs> and uh, we also do some extra content um, where we will be talking about some railway stuff in the future, um, various things like we both like trains a lot. We just did a trip on Via Rail. And I'm going to say it on this podcast, even though it's going to be not be coming up for months, but I just uh, want to let people know that we did something incredibly dumb on Via Rail a couple months or about a month ago. Terrific. So everyone needs to be paying attention so that they can work out what dumb thing was done on Via Rail. Because if you're going to do dumb stuff, uh, as long as you're safe and healthy, uh, doing dumb stuff on trains is fun. Um, so uh, yeah, that's amazing. So yeah, check out check out uh, Shonigan Moments. Um, and I've got I'm going to have questions. You've already pointed me in questions. I need to ask Riley about what the hell is going on here? Question mark. <laughs> but uh, we're going to save that. People can find that out by tuning into the to the podcast. No, thank you so much. And, and then I'm going to. Have Hand on to future me to see what the next episode is going to be. Future me, yes, past Gareth. It is. Um, it's a, a giant shift of tone. Actually, we're going to be going through the executive summary of the Grenfell fire report, phase two uh, of the inquiry. We're going to be going through the executive summary because there is an awful lot we need to learn as an industry. So I think this should be um, vital and uh, fascinating reading. Thank you, future me. Let's get our enormous faces back. Uh, Carrie, that has just been a terrific episode. I've had so much fun. That was great. We've learned so much um, and covered a lot of ground. Um, 
just yeah that's what i love rail Nat for nerdy but interesting and, and and lessons for us to learn about what we do now with transit and what what, what where there have been missteps but actually kind of a positive story like there have been some missteps but even the misstep you know even you look at the at the canada line yes a misstep in terms of the funding model that will cost the the region a lot more in the long run but not a total disaster like still the right infrastructure is kind of there and kind of delivering what it needs to right and and it could be f- f- not entirely painful like it wouldn't be entirely painless but equally it wouldn't be a, a it's not prohibitive to sort of fix it a bit and, and and improve the capacity and such so actually it's a good news story actually i think mm-hmm. um it's nice yeah, it's absolutely. nice to be like you know what this city is doing good things and expanding it as well so no, it's it's great. Um, Carrad, we'll we will find excuses to 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 do something else in the future, of course. But um, uh, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. It only remains for all for for us to everyone in in real world uh, listening to this. Thanks for watching and and cheerio, cheerio. <laughs>